Then the churches throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and were edified. And walking in, say it with me, please, walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, they were multiplied. Now, that's a long title, Fear of the Lord and the Comfort of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to focus on the comfort of the Holy Spirit. But it does say the fear of the Lord first. Very important in modern-day America, in modern-day places that are compromising often over what we have thought to be non-contentious non issues, the definition of a man and a woman. God is not confused about that. Our culture is unbelievably confused about that. But we're going to be the plumb line of the truth, the compass that points to true north and say, no, men and women made in the image of God. That's not confusing. I know, I'm not mocking the people who are confused about that. That's, that's what we're here for, to help. We're here to help them with that. The Bible says that Jesus makes the crooked way straight. So any kind of crooked thinking, he can make it straight. And that's another day's topic, too. But this is Acts chapter 9, and if you know anything about the Gospels and Acts, there was a lot of contending going on to get the truth out there. Stephen was already martyred. They killed him just for trying to preach the Gospel. That's serious? We don't have that here in America, that not, at least not that we know about. It says on your dollar bill, in God we trust. Regardless of what they're saying in other places, there's the root of this country is saying that God has to be first, not us. So this is the churches throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace. That's because God just rested peace upon them after contending to get the church started. And thousands of people were serving the Lord already and walking in the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit. That kept multiplying. So our goal would never be as a church to say, well, I think the amount of people we have is, is enough for us. We don't want to grow anymore. That's not the Holy Spirit telling you that. Now, look, you might have to get more help. <laughs> because if you're already working really hard, you've got to train up more people. You equip the saints for the work of the ministry so that you have more than enough help for all the new people that are going to be coming in. That's part of what he's asking us to do. Equip the saints to make my life easier. No, equip the saints to do the work of the ministry so that we can reach more people and more people get healed. And then we stand before him one day and say, you know what, Lord, you said, Paul said, you've been to the stadium and you've seen the races. Everybody runs to win, but only one wins. Run to win. <laughs> so I played football. You don't win every game. You can't. No, no team wins every game, and it wouldn't even, that, would, that kind of defeat the purpose, is that we're all out there trying the best we can. That's what you have to answer for yourself is, am I, can I look in the mirror after the game, even if we lost, and say, yes, but I left it all out on the field. That's how we would have said it. That's what I think is a good way to look at our walk with God. Now, please believe me, it's not works mentality. You can't earn it. You can't earn your salvation. But if you're if you're brought into the kingdom based on fear that if you don't say yes, you're going to go to hell, that's not the best motivation to wake up excited about serving God. It should be, oh, my God, he saved me. He saved my life. I should be dead. I want to serve him because I love him. And I, I'm sure there will be plenty of people that are willing to help me figure out what I should be doing and what I should not be doing because nobody plays every position on any team. Maybe you could say Magic Johnson. They're pretty rare. Right? I mean, that guy was amazing. So, look, here's the deal. I want to stand before him one day and say, hear him say, you know, well done, good and faithful servant. That's different for every one of us here. But we all should have that goal. That we're, you know, again, one of the things I learned from my wife is she must have said to me a thousand times, we got to step it up. We got to step it up. Where we are is good, but we got to go deeper. I'm like, I'm going to hear this the rest of my life. We don't get there. And then I started to like it. No, really, because that's the goal. I mean, she was right. Our flesh gets weak and gets tired. And I'm thinking in the beginning, like, is she ever happy about anything? But that wasn't the point. See, that, that was my carnal thinking. That's the wrong way to look at it. 
Because at the football game, nobody's ever happy that you win. Um, lose, sorry, they're happy when you win. Nobody's happy when you lose. But you know that's part of the deal. So people in ministry often get very discouraged because somebody they were praying for died. And then we think, well, maybe it was my lack of power that caused them to die. Well, but first of all, there's a war going on. There's casualties in war. Let's not blame God for something the devil did. Again, another day's topic, but he's the comforter which helps me recognize, yes, I might not have won the game, but I still have the power of God on the inside of me to overcome whatever weaknesses are in my flesh that are stopping me. And then in 19, which is 10 chapters later, this is powerful. So the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. And let me tell you, it's still prevailing in the world. It may not be prevailing as much as we'd like to see in America, although I wonder because, you know, we saw that big revival happening at Asbury College. And what you're seeing on the news is not always representative of what's really happening out there. Right? You saw, hopefully, you saw the Jesus Revolution movie, and I was a little young for that, but I definitely caught a lot of the tailwind of it. And, man, it was amazing what was happening. John Wimber said during that season of a few years, 250,000 new converts were baptized in the Pacific Ocean. In like a six or seven year period. Talk about the favor of God. It's called the Jesus People Movement, right? So the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. I'm not going to feel like a failure if I'm not seeing all the results that I'm hoping to see. I'm going to just say, Lord, I'm, I'm getting up today. I'm going to give you the best I got. That's what you get. You get the best I have. I'm not going to bury my talent in the ground. I'm going to do what you asked me to do. I'm going to be about the Father's business. And hopefully by being in a healthy culture with other Christians, we're all ironing, sharpening, ironing. <laughs> and uh, we're, that's what it says, that we would spur one another on to love and good works. What a powerful thing that is. So I love what Paul said. He was a very humble guy after he, fall off, he fell down on the road to Damascus. He was humbled after having... A lot of pride about all his knowledge. In Philippians, he says, everything I counted as important, I counted as a loss. All my status that I had, serving under Gamaliel, knowing all the scriptures the way I did, I was the expert that everybody would come to and ask, for question, ask their questions to. No, counted it all as a loss, that I might know him and be found in him. Woo! This is the same man who says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, I didn't pose as an expert with all the answers. I did not pretend... Uh, yeah, do not pretend to explain the mystery of God with eloquent speech and human wisdom. My message was not delivered with the kind of persuasive elegance <laughs> some have come to expect. He was being criticized for not being a good public speaker by the carnal people in Corinth. But the words were effective because I relied on God's spirit to demonstrate God's power. Can we just make that confession? I rely on God's spirit to demonstrate God's power. It can't be about Peter Roselli's high IQ and all that education and MDiv and D-min. Watch out for the demon. <laughs> if this were not so, your faith would be based on human wisdom and not on the power of God. Oh, I'm telling you, that stuck with me all week. I can't base my faith on my human wisdom, although the Bible says guard your heart study scripture. It's not that you disconnect, but the ultimate final decision is the power of God, not our human wisdom. So in Luke 4, okay, this is after he's been out and, and been tempted in the wilderness. It says when he got baptized, what happened? A dove came down. He was baptized with the Holy Spirit symbolically. He didn't need to get baptized because there was sin in his life, but this was a, a foretelling of the story. That we repent, we get baptized, we come out of Egypt, we're, we're out of slavery, and then we get filled with power to serve God. And the voice of the Lord speaks. And it says, he went into the town and went into the temple, and they gave him a scroll. And this is awesome, because he's just quoting Isaiah, but he's speaking of himself. The Spirit of the Lord, the Eternal One, is on me, because the Eternal designated me to be his representative to the poor. How many could say that that's your designation today? I'll wait, I'll wait, I'll wait. This is every Christian, sorry. Hate to break the news. We've all been designated as ambassadors for Christ. And that spirit is there because we all need it. You can't do it without the power of the spirit. That's why everything changed. 
after Acts chapter 2. We're as representative to the poor, and that doesn't mean people that just don't have a lot of money. It means poor in spirit. That's the language she uses in Matthew 5. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom. That's a little confusing, isn't it? We'll get there. To preach, which I'll say proclaim, the good news to them, he sent me to tell those who are held captive that they can now be set free. So we like to think of it as two wings on the bird, proclamation and demonstration. Proclamation, demonstration. We say that God heals, and then we pray for them to be healed. Well, what if they don't get healed? Well, that's not my problem. I was obedient. The blessing comes in obedience. And faith is not by what we see. It's by what we believe. Right? So don't go by that. Just say, he told me to do it. I'm going to keep on doing it. Don't have to be a long prayer either. And to tell the blind that they can now see. He finishes in Luke 4.18. He says, he sent me to liberate those held down by oppression. The spirit is upon me to proclaim that. Say it with me, please. Now is the time. Come on, one more time. Now. Well, yeah, but he said this 2,000 years ago, Pastor. God is not bound by time. Now is the time for that revelation to go off in your mind to say, I'm about my father's business. I'm going to do the same things that Jesus did. If I'm his disciple, I'm being molded into his image. And, and he said the spirit is upon me to proclaim that now is the time. Though we do know that he was initiating and inaugurating the kingdom, but we're all still part of that. And Acts has 28 chapters, so we live in Acts chapter 29. You get it? We are the open book that is supposed to be doing the works of the Father. Thank you. Not my line, but I'll, I'll take the applause anyway. But, man, this is so powerful. This is the Jubilee season. That meant so much to the Jews. A Jubilee was every 50 years all the debts would get canceled. Oh, my God, it was this uh, an amazing piece of the law that was in there. Pentecost, 50 days, seven weeks plus one day. You're now in this next season where you get a new start. Sounds like salvation to me. Sounds like being washed and having weight lifted off me and having the light go on and, and getting my innocence restored again. It's the year of the Jubilee, but every year is the year of Jubilee with Jesus. Because we have Holy Spirit. It's the same Spirit. It's just, really, like I said, it's, not a, it's the opposite of a works mentality. It's a yielding process. It's a humbling process. It's taking the chaff out of our lives and putting that on the altar. It's becoming more and more pure like him. We sang it this morning. I looked, not everybody was singing it. Just kidding, just kidding. Got to keep you on your toes. You can have my heart. You can have my heart. And it's like, well, you can have part of my heart. <laughs> you love the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's the greatest commandment. Not so easy. He told them that these words from the Hebrew Scriptures were being fulfilled then and there in their hearing. They didn't like that one. They thought he was getting a little uppity. Getting a little too big for your britches. That's what they say down in Texas. They don't say it here. And in Matthew 4, similarly comes out of the wilderness, temptation, and now his ministry starts. And it says, word spread all over Syria as more and more sick people came to him with all sorts of diseases. That's a really important thing to remember. This is the demonstration part. Proclamation that you can be saved is one thing. S getting healed is a whole other thing, isn't it? Salvation is a form of healing of our soul. You think there's some sick souls in America today? Oh, my God. I can't remember a time that's been this bad, right? And there's reasons for it. But I'm not better than them or worse than them. I've just tried to yield to Jesus, the great physician, and he's healed me. So wounded, I'm sorry, word spread all over Syria and more and more sick people came to him with all sorts of diseases. It's like when they came to him for more bread. It's like, well, we don't know anything about it, but I know I'm hungry and he makes bread. And Jesus didn't say, well, no, you're here for the wrong reason. Right? If they were coming because they were sick, they knew he could do something about it. And we forget that sometimes. It's not us. It's not man's wisdom. It's the power of God working through us. They were in crippling pain. They were possessed by demons. I'm sure glad that doesn't happen anymore. They had seizures. They were paralyzed. But Jesus healed them all. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Jesus healed them all. 
He wants the church to do the same thing. If we're not growing, maybe we're just not doing what he told us to do. Well, if, if I'm too afraid that it might not work, then that's not the faith that he wanted. That, that's what Peter had to walk out of that boat. He had to have enough faith to take that first step. It's not easy. They were paralyzed, but Jesus healed them all. And then the crowds got even larger because this is the best medical plan that anybody's offering. No premium. No deductible. Just get healed. No medication after to stay on. Large crowds from Galilee, Jerusalem, from the ten cities called the Decapolis, from Judea, and from the region across the Jordan followed him. It's just one guy. How much pain is in that audience? My God, you can't even measure how much pain is in that audience. How many sick souls? Never mind the sickness in their bodies, but just the soul sickness of wrong thinking and being abused and all the horrible things that people do to each other. How many? Well, let's, if you think about what we just read, they had all sorts of diseases. Crippling pain, possessed by demons. They were having seizures and they were paralyzed. But what if it was today? <laughs> Possessed by demons? A couple, yeah, a couple. Of, I pass them on the highway sometimes. But how about this? Depression. Huge problem in America today. All this progress, more people taking meds for depression than ever before. I don't think that's progress. I couldn't believe when I read this, I had to double check it. 50 million people in 2021 were diagnosed with a form of mental illness in America, just in America. I had no idea, I had no idea until I was looking. 1.7 million suicide attempts in 2021 in America. In America, this great economy, all this technology that we have, 1.7 million people wanted to take their life and tried to take it. Now, I have a feeling that if they heard the good news proclaimed and demonstrated, they might change their mind. A little louder, please. Yes. Anybody here think you'd be dead if you didn't get saved? Wow. That's a pretty good premium you didn't have to pay. Never mind hell for eternity versus ruling and reigning with Christ forever. So this is really serious. And then the drug deaths in 2021 were 70,000 people overdosed. In 2022, 109,000 that they have record of. That's a huge percentage increase. That's 40,000 more people that was already at an all-time high. Fentanyl is the main thing. Well, look, sinners will keep on sinning. Sinners will keep looking to medicate their pain with something other than the gospel. But the reason we proclaim and demonstrate is to show them that this is real. How many people have you ever met that were hurt in church somewhere? Somebody has. Oh, man, the, the war stories that I would hear when people would ask us, what do you do? Oh, well, we have a ministry. We started a church. The first thing they say, like an involuntary reaction is, Oh, man, the priest charged my mother $500 to bury my father. I never went back to that place again. Like, whoa, like, wait a minute. Like, I wasn't going there. But, but they're holding on to the hurt, right? I won't go there. I'm not trying to pick on the Catholic Church. I'm just saying that this part of the world, there does seem to be a lot of church hurt. But everywhere you go, it's the same way. They have the wrong impression of Jesus. Let them see him in you. Proclaim the truth to them and demonstrate the power. That's all God's asking us to do. So he goes up on a mountain. This is Matthew chapter 5. As Moses had done before him. And he sat down as Jewish teachers of his day usually did. And his disciples gathered around them. Around him, sorry. And I think it was like that big scene with all those people there. And it says, he began to teach the crowd. Not the disciples. He was teaching the crowd. He had really good projection for his voice. And he started the Sermon on the Mount. And the first thing he said in the Sermon on the Mount is, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs, I'm sorry, the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Now that's a confusing verse to a lot of people. 
because, wait a minute, Jesus, you realize that we're the ones that are suffering with all sorts of diseases, crippling pain, possessed by demons, seizures, and paralyzed. How am I blessed? Doesn't sound like blessed to me. And the answer is not that you're blessed because you have those things. You're blessed because now you have access to God's kingdom. And the kingdom resources that we even have more of because we are filled with the Holy Spirit. Before this, he said, you're going to do greater things than me because I'm just one person. But now it's going to go all over the world. Oh. So we're blessed because of the availability of the kingdom that he brought us, okay? They're hurting because Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is birthday cakes. No. But we do. We try to medicate our pain. We think sugar is going to stop the pain. Right? Like, how many ways can you get sugar delivered into your body? Ten billion. I'm a little under stress. Let's have some chubby hubby ice cream. Ben and Jerry, great name. No, nah, it's probably not the best answer. Had a really rough day at work. I need a drink. Well, you need a Holy Ghost visitation. Take another drink of him. Living waters. Not unlimited spirits. <laughs> the wages of sin is death. How many ways have we seen this happen? Pagan people that don't know the Lord have always killed babies. We're talking about first choice. If they don't know, there's another way. But when they see the, what's it called again? I'm sorry, the machine, the sonogram. It's an incredible number of percentage of people. And look, I'm sure in a room this size and people watching that somebody here was involved in an abortion in your life. It's really not meant to in any way pile on top of the pain. Those things are gone. They're behind us. That's part of what has been cast to the depths of the sea. As far as the east is from the west, he removes our transgressions from us. We did that when we didn't know him. But even if we backslid after we knew him, he still forgives us. It's amazing how many chances we have with the Lord. So it's not condemning. It's just saying, tap into this gift. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And I feel like we just thought that meant I get to go to heaven when I die. And we just marginalized it to this life's not going to be so great, but it's sure going to be great on the other side. And that is not what Jesus said. In this life and in the age to come. You are going to be blessed. Those are the words that he used. Maybe I'll talk about that next week. Hint, hint. This is where that fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit comes in. Is when you're up here on the prayer ministry team and there's a long line of people waiting to get prayed for. And the person that is in front of you right now just said a story that you can't believe of something that happened to them. You know, you're innocent in the morning. You know you're going to be on the prayer ministry team. And Lord... Help me feel the pain of the people that I pray for at the altar. Okay, you asked. Well, I, I'm telling you, it's very disarming of any of your defenses when you hear the pain some people have had to walk through and that they're still standing here in front of you asking for prayer. They didn't quit. But you just get, like, twisted up, like, how could somebody do that? And you start crying. And that's not so bad. That's what Jesus said. Weep with those who weep. Celebrate with the ones who celebrate. But it's hard to not keep crying when the next person comes up for prayer. Because there's a lot of people that need help right now. That's what I'm thinking here. You're looking out at that crowd. How can we ever meet the needs of all these people? He's not asking you to. Just deal with the one who's in front of you right now. Got a couple of those. Amens. So I just wanted to give you some commentary because, like I said, there, as we were coming up as Christians, you know, me in the 80s and 90s, we didn't hear a lot about God's kingdom for today. right? We just didn't understand the seven mountain teaching that Lance Wall now does and Ephesians 4, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, that we're to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. It's all continually being revealed to us. 
that's not to be critical of, of the people that were teaching us. They were doing the best they could. But when you really understand that he gave us access to the kingdom here, now, you're never going to be the same again. You, when you pray for people, it's not you. It's you accessing the kingdom power. God, come now. Let your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. It's not my power saving this person or, or healing their broken leg or whatever. It's your power through us as your ambassadors. So the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost was a significant milestone in the inauguration of God's kingdom rule in the earth. Okay, think about it that way. We were back here before Jesus came, a big mess. He's born, Luke chapter 1. The, the angels appear to the shepherds in the field all through his life and ministry. He never sins even though he was tempted. He dies. Then that period goes by. Forty days he's appearing to them after the resurrection. And then, boom, inauguration day. Holy Spirit is now available to everybody. Do you need more Holy Spirit? It's kind of a tricky question, isn't it? Because there was multiple times that they got baptized in the Holy Spirit. But what about just accessing what you already have? Feel my pain. <laughs> you already have more than you realize. So that's where it might take a little pain to fast and pray and tell your sugar addiction to shut up. We will have prayer at the altar after. <laughs> Jesus taught the kingdom of God operates in hearts. <laughs> of people willing to submit to God's authority as king. I might not get much further than this, but let me just tell you. They were expecting a, a warring army to defeat the Romans. Good luck with that one. My ancestors were tough. They weren't getting defeated by any army. They got defeated by Jesus. It was so good they couldn't deny it. They made Christianity the religion. And even like a counterfeit version of it still toppled the empire more than firing a shot or any other form of military action. He won the hearts of the people. That's where the kingdom rule is. It starts right here. And that's what I'm challenging you, is that you already have Holy Spirit. Yield to what's there. Yield to the knowledge of combining the word that he gives you with that spirit. And ask the, the spirit of God to just oil what's already inside of us in every conversation that you have. Whenever you talk to people, he wants to help us in that interaction. I'm almost done. I know what time it is. He opened the present availability of God's kingdom as well as the future reality of the age to come. So that's, that's why he said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom. They're not blessed because they're poor in spirit. They're blessed because people are going to pray with them. They're blessed because they can plug into the body of Christ with no strings attached. They're blessed because there's a group of people who realize that to whom much has been given, it's okay. Freely you have received, so... <laughs> yeah, that's called ministry. The, the backbone of the global church is the volunteers that serve in ministry. If you serve here, thank you. Thank you. It's amazing. We don't always feel so qualified, do we? But he uses us. Kind of reminds us. It's not about us. Holy Spirit's outpouring empowered the disciples with the fuel of heaven's sustainable energy. Talk about solar power. You got the sun sustaining the Holy Ghost in you. Never runs out of gas. He never slumbers or sleeps. We've got heaven's sustainable energy in us. Now it's just a matter of of tapping into it. Amen? I'm kind of making that point over and over. But I did want you to see that the thing that drives the most kingdom advancement is agape love. Faith, hope, and love. The greatest of these, agape. Because there's lots of loves. There's different kinds of love. You, you could love cheesecake. This is different. <laughs> I keep going back to sugar, don't I? It's a problem. <laughs> What makes you go witness to a drug dealer? What makes women that were sold, sold as sex slaves when they get free, what makes them go back to get their friends when they know they could be killed? I'm already safe now. I'm out. Huh. Love. That's what drives them to go back. 
love. That's the only way. Can't be about us. I'm going to skip through that and we'll touch on it next week. I want to finish up here because of the time. I'm going to do this next week too. I had a lot today, didn't I? <laughs> How unusual, Pastor. <laughs> If an outsider or unbeliever is in your midst and all are prophetically speaking for God with great power and insight, hopefully that's us, the outsider would come under conviction of his own sins and be called to accountability by the words of the prophets. That's called conviction. Somebody gives you a prophetic word and you've never even met them before and they know something about you and you know it had to be God that told you, told them that. And the very secrets of their heart would be revealed. And right then and there, mystified, he would fall on his face in worship to God, proclaiming all the while that God must certainly dwell among you. Isn't that a powerful picture? We shouldn't accept anything less. We shouldn't accept regular church where we're not expecting to experience God. He's expecting for us to experience him. Amen. Wherever two or three are gathered, I'm with you. So this, this is all of us, all the time. God most certainly dwells among you. Well, look at somebody and say to them, he dwells in you and among us. Let's stand. I already quoted that one. Thank you. I'm sorry we're not having fellowship. Kind of got you your hopes up for coffee. That'll be next week. I love this. We were at a first choice banquet. They have the most amazing speakers. They were supposed to have Tony Evans that year. Yeah. He couldn't make it because his wife was in really bad shape with cancer. So his son came. And his son had been an NFL football player. Right, amazing. Like, that's pretty rare. And this is the verse. Um, that the son brought. And I never forgot it. I had read the verse many times, but I never forgot the way he helped me see the truth of it here is this is, this is really every one of us is what God is asking us to do. It says, as for David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, he fell asleep and was laid with his fathers. And there's, we all just need a reason to get up every morning. And this is the best reason I have found is to serve the Lord. Because we have this limited window of time left, whatever that is. doesn't matter how old you are. There's only going to be a certain amount of days to all of our lives. So why wouldn't I, in my, my desire to love him enough to hear him say, well done, not because I need a badge. He saved my life. I really am one of those people that would not be here if I didn't get saved. So that should be swell up so much gratitude in us that we can even overcome the pain and, and the ways that people have let us down. Every one of us would raise our hand over that, including I let you down sometimes. I get it, but we got to push through. It wasn't intentional. I hope you know that, that it wasn't intentional. And now we could just keep trading with what he gave us. We're not going to bury the talent. We're going to occupy until he comes. Amen? So this is where he finished and where I want to finish when he was done with the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 7. The reason we know he was speaking to all the crowd and not just his disciples is because it says the people were amazed at the things that Jesus spoke. We're not often amazed by the things that we hear people talking about, but they said he spoke as one having authority. You have that authority. Whatever you've been taken out of, whatever drug addiction that was broken off your life, whatever sexual sin, Joyce Meyer was incredibly abused by her father. She's got authority now as a Christian to help other people get free from the pain that comes from the very person that you were hoping would protect you is violating you. And she leads him to the Lord before he dies. Agape. Nothing else could have done that. Agape is the only thing that would help us overcome the resentment and the unforgiveness and the pain that we would feel. I want it, Lord. I want more of your character, more of your nature inside me so that I could do what he said right here. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does them, that's key. Proclamation and demonstration. 
We're going to pray today right here at the altar for anybody who wants prayer. We're expecting God to move. We're expecting you to get healed. If the person praying for you doesn't, don't get prayer from them because they got to have enough faith to believe it can work. Right? Let's do it. Like, it's not by what I see. It's by faith that you're going to do it, Lord. We know it's your will to heal us. We know it's your will to heal us. You're the life giver. You didn't come to destroy life. You came to save us. And let us just ring true with the truth of your word. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does them is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And we know that the one who hears them and doesn't do them is like the one who built his house on the sand, right? I didn't go through all that with you, but which one do you want? Clearly, it's got to be the rock. The way the storms are raging in the culture today, if you don't know where you stand, you're going to get blown over. But no, I mean, even women now are rising up and saying, wait a minute, I want, I want to help trans people, but what about the women in college sports that are getting trained in their whole lives, and now all of a sudden a man who's just saying he's a woman comes in and defaults four years of her hard work. Time to wake up. Love trans people. They need Jesus. Everybody needs Jesus. But what about the girls? Having men walking into their locker room, having men in the prison who were sex abusers saying, oh, I'm a woman today. Spirit of stupid. Come out of our culture. I said I was finishing. Now I'm spitting. <laughs> I just want to pray for you. The rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house. But it did not fail. It did not fall because it was built on the rock. So, Lord, I thank you. The tribe at King of Kings are seeking after your heart. Their food is to do the will of the one who sent them. They are men and women after God's own heart. But we are seeking not only just to hear what you say, but to translate it into our actions thank you that we live in this period that your word says the angels could only hope for what we have and we have it help us to see it and have an urgency of how badly the culture is hurting and needs to hear not just the truth being spoken but the demonstration of your power as you did it for us to whom much has been given lord we say we want to give back out of love not out of fear help us give back out of love in jesus name everybody said amen Love you all very much. I told you three different times. There's a prayer ministry team coming up. If you need prayer, if you're not sure about Jesus and you don't know if you've ever said yes to him, come on up. Let us talk to you about how real this is. Those of you on the prayer ministry team, please come up now. Come up that aisle if you want prayer. We'll see you Wednesday night.